guys want to just, just trust the police and the batteries and make that all work. Test one, two. Check, check, one, two. If everybody could grab a seat. This is, this is a remarkable turnout. Look at all of you. Thank you all for being here this morning. My name is Chris Hall. I'm the CEO of the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I just want to welcome you all here this morning and thank you for taking some time. Um, uh, I was very uh, pleased when NRCM reached out to the chamber to ask us to co-host this event. And, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, I have worked personally in, uh, in the field of environmental policy for the business community. This seemed like a great opportunity to show uh, everyone, because everyone is going to hear about this, uh, that uh, our environmental community and our business community uh, share uh, similar opinions on this topic and can come together and have a conversation about it and hopefully move the agenda forward both here in Maine and, and at the national level as well. So your presence here today is greatly appreciated. I want to thank you all. Because I'm good at it and, uh, and no one else wanted to do it, I, uh, I'm also going to thank our sponsors. It's something the Chamber of Commerce guys get to do a lot. Uh, but really, seriously, uh, you know, when, when companies sponsor events like this, um, it is, uh, it's not just the cash. Uh, it is the recognition that they want to be associated uh, with moving the community forward. So uh, I want to thank all of our sponsors, Revision Energy, Grid Solar, Norman Hansen Detroit, Curtis Thaxter Public Affairs Group, and last but not least, the organic fair trade coffee provided by Others Cafe in Monument Square. I'm not going to take any more time off our agenda. I'm going to introduce to the stage my partner, Lisa, for NRCM, who's going to take us through the rest of the morning's agenda. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Lisa Pullman, the executive director of the Natural Resources Council of Maine. We are very pleased to gather you all together at the end of what is an historic week. On Monday, the Obama administration announced that they were taking the single biggest step to address climate change to date. Finally, our federal government will be setting limits on the amount of carbon dioxide that the nation's power plants can put into the air. Power plants are the largest single source of carbon pollution. They have been emitting carbon unabated for over a century, and that is contributing to climate change. Finally, as a nation, we are recognizing that climate change is real, Carbon pollution is helping to drive it, and it's harming our environment, our health, and our future. So this week we also learned that Maine and Vermont are warming faster than all other states. That's because the Arctic Sea is melting, and that is changing the temperature of the airflow coming our way. So this warming is harming our nature-based industries like fisheries, it's creating more severe weather events that get in the way of doing business, like destroying coastal properties, closing bridges, warping train tracks. It's increasing health risks like Lyme disease and asthma. And it's putting our treasured wildlife at risk, like brook trout and moose. So we have a moral obligation to our kids and our grandkids to move in a different direction, so that the Maine we love is there for them. We need to shift how we produce energy and learn to use it more efficiently. And big shifts like this are tough. But we've already started in Maine. We know that we can work together to solve environmental and economic problems as big as climate change. We know that cleaner energy creates business opportunities for Maine. We were the first state in the nation to create a climate action plan. We are one of nine northeastern states to already put limits on carbon pollution from our region's power plants, and we started back in 2009 with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. And you're going to hear that REGI has been a win-win all along. So these new EPA rules will just help the rest of the states catch up. Once again, as Maine goes, so goes the nation. I'm so pleased 
to introduce Bob Perciseppi, who uh, it, I feel like is gracing Maine with uh, his presence from the EPA in Washington. We don't always get the special visitors from Washington. Bob was appointed by President Obama in 2009 as the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Deputy Administrator and has a career spanning nearly four decades as one of the nation's leading environmental and public policy figures. An expert on environmental stewardship, advocacy, public policy, and national resource and organizational management, Perciseppi is widely respected within both the environmental and business communities. His extensive experience includes service both inside and outside of government. He served as a top EPA official in the administration of President Bill Clinton, who appointed him first to serve as the nation's top water official, and later as the senior official responsible for air quality across the U.S. Prior to being named in his current position, he was chief operating officer at the National Audubon Society, one of the world's leading environmental organizations. He has also held top positions within state and municipal government, including as Secretary of the Environment for the State of Maryland and as a senior official for the city of Baltimore. Well, thank you for that welcome and, and that introduction. Um, uh, and it's really an honor to be here with you, to be honest with you, because the work that's before us is really going to be done at the state and local level. Um, we're just going to try to set the, set the course. So we'll. We'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that, and then I think we'll have some our good discussion as the morning goes on. So I want to thank you and the and the uh, the Natural Resources Council, and also the Portland Chamber and Chris for bringing everybody together to have this conversation. It's really it's really important, and uh, I'm looking forward to having the senator here uh, uh, shortly so that we can uh, he can join in in our conversation. You know he's been. Uh, representing you in Washington and he's been a great supporter of taking action and he's also been a great supporter of, of EPA and, and some of the work we do uh, with always that Mainer common sense uh, angle that you know make sure you do it right and, and, and don't make any mistakes I don't know if you've ever heard him say those things those of you who have worked for him know that but um, but he often points out and I think this is so right that that trying to become a more efficient country, create job opportunities for this, and deal with pollution at the same time is not a political issue. It's sort of like a common sense, like why aren't we doing more of this? And of course you know this in Maine because you already deal with this. You know, carbon pollution from power plants um, is making the oceans warmer. Um, I was just talking to my old friend from Audubon here and the effect it's having, have, having on puffins. Those of you who know about puffins up on Egg Island. Um, we, we know that it hurts shellfish for sure and we have different species of fish moving around that are the feed and food sources for other organisms like puffins and lobsters. Um, I think lobsters mean something in Maine. I, I'm not sure, but I think it does. I know I eat them. So um, the shellfish industry here is pretty important and, and it's part of the heritage of the state. So um, it's really important that we, that we tackle this as a country and we tackle it as a world. Um, EPA is putting out this proposal this week. It is a proposal, it's not yet a final rule, um, but it's already sending signals to the rest of the world that the United States is serious about trying to deal with these issues. And that is going to change the dynamic in international discussions, because ultimately it has to be an international solution. We have to, as a globe, uh, take action. But there's nothing that should stop this country from taking leadership, both on the business opportunities that are important part of this, and also on the other uh, pollution control and moral obligations we have to future generations. You know, this is the reason that EPA took the action we took earlier in the week as part of President Obama's Climate Action Plan, which has those three key parts to it, reduce and mitigate emissions, be resilient and prepared for the impacts we're going to have, and deal uh, more forcefully on the international arena. And um, you know, with power plants, we already limit quite a bit of pollution, and the industry has done quite a lot to reduce their pollution. We reduce things like mercury, 
sulfur dioxide, acid rain, which was a big issue back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and something that has been slowly but surely uh, bet getting better. Uh, arsenic. We, we control these pollutants. We haven't controlled carbon pollution. It has been uncontrolled, uh, uh, as, as was said already, that for quite a while, maybe forever. So the science is clear. Um, the risks are clear. And what we're knowing more now is the cost of inaction is growing. So um, the standards we proposed at the beginning of this week are a flexible framework to make reductions. The, the action will move to the states, but when you look at the full impact of those goals that we proposed over the next decade into, into 2030, it's a 30% reduction in carbon emissions from the power generating section in this country. And it's quite, it's quite transformative, and we're very excited, we're really excited about it. And, you know, I talked about rising temperatures a little bit, the effect on sea life as well as, as uh, organisms who, uh, and wildlife that relies on it. I think one of my favorite fish, the brook trout and the rainbow trout, were just recently mem mentioned as well. Um, you know, the pollution that we're talking about comes bundled with other pollution. So we already are controlling mercury and arsenic and sulfur, but when we start to control carbon pollution, we will get further reductions in those other pollutants as well. And Maine knows all too well how the air flows in the United States from the west and the southeast to the, north, to the northeast. And for, for years, Maine has participated in regional discussions about pollution reduction to reduce the transport of pollutions to the northeastern part of the United States, whether it's acid rain or the precursors to ozone and trying to reduce ozone formation in the, in the southern part of the state. So, you know, if you're a parent and your child doesn't have asthma, you're, you're, you're lucky. One, one in ten children in, in Maine have asthma. And so some of the pollutants that are triggers for asthma are also going to be reduced as part of this rule. And I don't want to lose sight of that public health side of this. There's the long-term public health of global warming, but there's also the immediate benefits in public health. We predict that by 2020, this rule, if, when, we, when we finalize it, will avoid up to 100,000 asthma attacks a year and over 2,000 premature deaths due to cardiovascular disease. You know, it's a big deal in Maine because of the transport of pollutants in the country and it has an effect not just on, on our children and, and susceptible populations and our families, but also the forests, the crops, the lakes, the wildlife that has already been mentioned. So what does this proposal mean to Maine? Well, I think business people in this state, and I've talked to some of you already in this morning's reception, know better than most that doing nothing is not really a good option because it's costing us money. And we're seeing those impacts. You know, I mentioned the senator earlier, but he actually has been on the floor of the Senate talking about these things in speeches, about how the warming waters are affecting some of our coastal ecology here in the northeastern part of the United States and threatens the heritage of, of this part of the country in terms of fishing and, and shellfish. And it's something that I think all of us in our soul know that we want to leave this for our future generations, that we can't be the ones that make that not true, that, that we're not the ones that make this change so that we can't go back. And so um, when we put this proposal together, and I think this is the power of it, and why I said at the beginning this is, a lot of this is going to be based on work that you all do, is that this is a partnership. EPA is not going to come and say, you have to do exactly this or that. What we're doing is setting goals based on things that states are already doing around the country, including here in the Northeast. And we set those goals, but the actual plans will be done at the state level to capitalize on the work that's already going on. And we put a flexible situ situ system in place in this proposal that would allow some mixing and matching of different approaches that would be more suited for the local 
situation. We've made projections on what is doable here with the best situ situation, but when you get down to doing the plan, there'll be flexibility. And this is why we're um, happy about this rule, because of the common sense kind of approach that it takes and the partnership approach it takes. But I want you to know that Maine, along with eight other states in the Northeast, all the way down to my old state, uh, Maryland, and where I was born in New York, um, all are participating in the regional greenhouse gas initiative. And that initiative has been making an impact in the Northeast. And that initiative has helped EPA because Gina McCarthy, our administrator, was very active in the development of the REGI, everybody calls it. Um, and it has helped us how, learn how to put this proposal together so that REGI can slide right into it and, and capitalize on the momentum that it is developing. And, and the business opportunities that are, that are evolving from it. You know, there's been $30 million in energy efficiency investments in Maine alone since the REGI program was put in place. And you can see the reductions that have already been made in the information that is put forward by, uh, by many people who keep track of, including the REGI partnership itself. But the key point I want to make here is that you are not starting in Maine from ground zero. You are starting on the foundation that has already been built by REGI, and that is essentially taken into account in the goals that are set for the, state, for the states here. So the fact that work has already been done puts you in a different starting point. And to that respect, it is, your work has not been uh, for naught. It is also now being in, able to be incorporated into this. We know also that biomass is a big, important issue here in Maine. And certainly it is a tool that will be able to be used in state plans. And we are working very hard so that we can have a national framework on how you build biomass into carbon action plans and the carbon pollution reduction plans uh, going forward. And so we plan to have that done as we are going through. And we actually ask questions in this proposal about it. There was a big business opportunity involved with this program as well, and I, our estimates show that the, jo the number of jobs will increase in the United States uh, based on these proposals, particularly when you look at the energy efficiency side of the equation. And more, energy, more construction workers building energy efficiency into houses and businesses, retrofitting, weatherizing, um, and, uh, equipment manufacturers, material suppliers, next generation of of appliances that are more energy efficient, engineers designing things, uh, programmers building, com building computerized systems that make your homes and businesses smarter so that they save energy. Um, this is pretty important. And I know that affordability and cost is a pretty important part of what's every on everybody's mind. And I think you can be, you can be informed by how things have gone with Reggie and how the price of electricity has not, you know, uh, gone through the, the roof with some of the, what some of the uh, claims that were made. In fact, uh, in most parts of, of the Northeast, the price of electricity has become very stable, and in some cases, I think it's even dropped a little bit. And we would expect that as we implement this plan, that there will be some uh, variation in electric rates around the, around the country, but in, in a very normal range of, of vibration. And then at the, near the end of the, near the end of the implementation period, near moving into the next part of the, into the next decade, we would expect on average around the country that there'll actually be an 8% reduction in the bills that people have on average around the country, both residential and commercial. So um, the idea that we can do this and, and not have that kind of economic impact, uh, and the people who say uh, that we can't, well, first of all, we can we will, and the ones who say we can't are just wrong. I mean, the evidence is all over the place from regional cooperation already, particularly in this part of the country. So um, we're pretty excited about that. We're pretty excited about the business opportunities. This makes me feel great that the chamber and, and the council are together here because I think the shared vision has to be one that everyone has, being prepared for climate change and then really looking at the business opportunities and how these things work together. Because those things are what are a, the quality of life is all about. You know, a good economy and a clean environment 
go hand in hand. They're not in opposition. And we are proving it here in the Northeast, and this, this proposal is trying to capitalize on that and make the rest of the country uh, in the same position. You know, I want to point quickly to the fact that I know cars are also an important emitter of, of greenhouse gases. They're number two after the power plants, which are number one, which we're now starting to focus on. But uh, a couple of years ago, we worked on the cars, and we have a plan in place that the automobile industry is behind that will get us to 54 miles to the gallon by 2025 on average. And what that is doing is redu cutting in half the greenhouse gases from the light duty automobile fleet in the United States, which is hundreds of millions of cars, but it's also saving everybody money. Because if you use less, if you use half the gasoline than you, have, than you do today, or you did when we put the rule together, you're going to be saving money. So again, reducing pollution, stimulating new technology in automobiles and hiring people uh, in the automobile industry, and everybody and every family saving money. So we think we've built the right kind of structure here. We now are in the process of, it's your turn. You have to tell us how did we do and what do we need to keep our eye on to get this thing to the final, final stage. Did we miss anything? And this is for all of you, whether you're a teacher, a scientist, a mechanic, a, a lobsterman, whoever. We need your ideas. There's ways to get your information in at the website or any other way we want not only to hear from the state but, and the, the utility folks and the utility commission, but we also want to hear from, from you as individuals because we all are going to be the ones that ultimately make this happen when we work together and we pull in the right direction. And we're the ones that are going to leave the planet better than, than, than we found it and, and make sure that we pass on to our children what we inherited when, when we were born I guess I'm just speaking for myself there, I'm old. But, um, but we, in order to do this, we have to roll up our sleeves. And we have to roll up our sleeves in the most common sense way. So I apologize if I spoke a little bit too long here, but I really want you to know how important it is to hear from you, how important this partnership is. This is something the country has to do together. EPA can't wave a magic wand here and just make greenhouse gases go away. We have to all work on this. We have to capitalize on it from a business perspective, and we have to protect our public health and our environment. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the questions and answers, or at least the questions. So our next speaker is Charles Colgan, who is a professor of public policy and management in the Muskie School of Public Service at the University of Southern Maine. And he is the chair of the Masters in Community Planning and Development program as well. He is also Associate Director of the USM Center for Business and Economic Research and a Senior Fellow at the Center for the Blue Economy in Monterey, California. He served as Chair of the, Maine, of the State of Maine Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission from 1992 to 2010. And prior to coming to USM, he served in the Maine State Planning Office under three governors. I like to think of Charlie as the guy we all go to to find out what's going on in the Maine economy, Charlie Colgan. Thanks, Lisa, and good morning. Um, I want to emphasize, I want to uh, pick up on three themes that have been talked about um, this morning that I think are the essential message um, from today. First, um, the proposed regulations uh, are important to Maine um, because uh, the absence of such regulations puts us at a competitive disadvantage in the American economy. Uh, it's a disadvantage we've suffered from from a long time, and this begins to level the playing field on energy costs. Second, we know how to do this. Uh, we've been doing it um, successfully in Maine through REGI, um, and there's that lessons, the lessons learned from that are going to be critical not only to uh, no, Maine and the Northeast, but to the country as a whole. Um, and finally, there's that climate change thing. Um, which is uh, actually important to us, um, uh, both as citizens of Maine and of the world. Let me talk just for a couple of minutes about each of these. First, um, everybody complains about Maine's high energy costs. Uh, it's been a staple of concern in the business community for um, nigh on 40 years uh, since the Arab oil embargo. It, it is a real disadvantage, no matter how you measure it. Maine does tend to pay higher prices for electricity 
and for energy as a whole because we are so dependent upon oil and have historically been less uh, available uh, to use natural gas. Uh, in a 2008 study by myself, colleagues at the USM, at USM and the, and, uh, the Margaret Chase Smith Center at UMaine, um, we showed that Maine's principal cost disadvantage in doing business is not taxes, it's not labor, it's not uh, real estate, it's energy. But we also showed that a major portion of this energy cost disadvantage arises not so much because we are wildly expensive, but because other parts of the country have essentially been subsidized to use the air for free, the, particularly for the emissions of coal um, and other petroleum generating uh, plants. That subsidy, and it is a subsidy, there's nothing for free, and the air is not free just as other resources are not free, but other places have been able to essentially use that resource for dumping carbon um, byproducts into the atmosphere, and because it's been free, it's been overused, and because it's been free, other places have had lower costs than we've had to bear in terms of the generation of electricity. Um, by forcing coal producers particularly, and other fossil fuel producers in general, um, to begin to pay the full cost of their uh, production, um, this is going to help level the playing field here in Maine where we have, um, de we're dependent on um, cleaner natural gas, a uh, high, high portion of our electricity comes from renewables, wind and, and hydro, and where we have been as a result of the fact that we've been exposed to higher prices, become much farther ahead at finding ways to be energy efficient. The rest of the country is going to struggle over the next two decades to catch up to Maine in terms of becoming energy efficient, and these regulations are going to be a major reason why that's going to happen. Secondly, we know how to do this. Um, it's easier than the opponents claim, but the exact economic effects we don't know yet, and I'm going to be a numbers geek here and suggest that don't believe any, any jobs estimates on this one way or another, at least from the national level. We've been um, looking at this um, for a number of years, as, as has been mentioned, with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. Um, it's one approach to dealing with uh, air emissions. Uh, it's been characterized as a cap and invest strategy rather than a cap and trade strategy, and it's one among several different possibilities that states and regions in the U.S. can and will investigate in order to meet the new requirements uh, of the EPA regulations. Our, our approach has been to cap uh, carbon emissions, to sell, the tri to sell, auction off the right to emit carbon, and to use the proceeds from those auctions to invest in energy efficiency and in some states in um, renewables. Those investments in energy efficiency have resulted in substantial investments in Maine, something like $30 million and now oh, 1,000 jobs or so, but I said don't believe those exactly. Um, and 250, which is already uh, projected uh, to generate $257 million in lifetimes energy savings. They're big numbers um, available now and in, as we invest more uh, in the future in our energy efficiency, which is the cheapest way to deal with our energy price differential, the, if, uh, the effect um, uh, of the, uh, on the economy of Maine of generating more jobs in energy efficiency and renewables, um, non-polluting resources, will increase. But that's not the really important lesson from the REGI experience. The really important lesson from the REGI experience, and the data is absolutely clear on this point, that there is, it, it is entirely possible to continue to grow the economy even while emissions are shrinking. Up until the mid-2000s or so, emissions were essentially in lockstep with economic growth. But that pattern has been broken, largely as a result of reallocating our resources to more efficiency and to um, investments in non-emitting uh, generating sources and other things like uh, hybrid cars and so on. So REGI has actually achieved its goal in less than five years in terms of emission reductions. It's now emitting so much less than its original goal that it's working now to figure out how to lower its cap consistent with the new regulations. So it is possible to respond to the need to reduce CO2 emissions with little or no effect on economic growth. 
Opponents, such as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, have tried to argue that the cost of the proposed rules will be completely unbearable. What they've really shown in their study, as several commentators have pointed out, that even under their absolute worst um, uh, cataclyptic end, uh, apocalyptic ending, uh, um, the cost to GDP is only 0.2% per year. Um, I think we can handle that. And that's the worst case scenario. The Reggie experience suggests it's not even going to get anywhere near that. Still, I, I want to caution everyone um, against believing too much in the economists. Okay, I know I shouldn't say that. <sighs> on, the, on the economic impacts of this. And the reason for this is, this is these regulations are designed to d spur creativity, innovation, and new approaches, n all of which will be uh, taken up uh, if uh, taken up seriously will create ways in which we can't really even begin to imagine how they'll work. An article in the New York Times not long ago pointed out how California utilities are investing in methane digesters on Wisconsin dairy farms as offsets to their carbon emissions under the California program. Um, no one, no economist that I know of would predict that methane, that dairy farms in Wisconsin would be part of the California strategy. So it's a reminder that innovation and creativity are going to be the principal ways in which we deal with these. And so whether you believe the NRC, NRDC's plus 200,000 jobs or the U.S. Chamber's minus 200,000 jobs, the important point there is that the Reggie experience shows that there's little or no job effect, positive or negative, um, and that we can easily afford what we're talking about doing. Finally, climate change. Um, uh, climate change matters, um, and everything we can do uh, to deal with climate change, um, we need to do. Um, we are, in fact, three decades late in doing what we are doing now. The amount of he global heating and the amount of sea level rise that, if you will excuse the expression, is already baked into the atmosphere um, is already going to generate significant climate change in the next decade, and our struggle now is merely to avoid the absolute worst effects. Um, in Maine, uh, it's here, it's now, Lisa pointed out the most recent data on average temperatures. Um, we know that uh, sea level has been rising and warming uh, over the last 20 years or more. Uh, we know that we are at risk for natural resource industries, not only from things like the warming temperatures of the ocean driving the lobsters further north, uh, but also uh, ocean acidification. A lot of that excess carbon in the atmosphere gets stuck back in the ocean, raising the acid levels in the ocean, making it much more difficult for uh, crustaceans and mollusks to form their shells, and that's the bulk of our seafood industry these days. Less attention has been paid, though more should be, to the effects of climate change on our public infrastructure. Uh, we are already dealing with the problems of how to uh, manage a wetter and warmer Maine. Um, we will see more flooding. We will see more damage to our roads. We will see more potholes. I know we're all looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, at a time, incidentally, when as uh, noted, we are going to be using much less gas to pay for the road repairs. Um, we, have water, we have water and sewer plants uh, at risk, not so much in Maine, but in parts of the country, uh, like Florida and Cape Cod, where saltwater intrusion into the aquifers is going to be a major problem with sea level rise. Uh, and frankly, we just have an awful lot of people with stuff on the shoreline and in the harm's way. Um, not to pay attention to these infrastructure costs, because these are costs we all bear through our taxes. As, as if you look across the country, um, th there are some states whose entire economy is essentially in coastal counties, Rhode Island, Delaware, Hawaii. Um, of all the other states, Maine is the second most, Maine's economy is second most dependent upon its coastal location. So these are not trivial issues for us. Um, there are the ancillary health benefits that will result from this, and those are not to be uh, dismissed. 
But if you look at Maine as a whole and look at the natural resource industries in Maine, but just look at the part of Maine that we're all responsible for in our public infrastructure, it's clear that climate change is not something we can simply dismiss. In sum, we've shown that it's possible to address greenhouse gas emissions at low or negligible costs without any effect, without effect on the economy. We've proved that here in New England over the last several years at an extraordinarily difficult time, at exactly the time when you would think in the Great Recession when these things would matter the most, it turns out they've hardly mattered at all. We've suffered because other regions of the country have gotten away with using precious resources for nothing. And it's not only time to deal with climate change, it's past time. Uh, for all those reasons, I think those of us in Maine should look upon this as a real opportunity not only to improve our own uh, ways of addressing climate change, but uh, hopefully encouraging our colleagues and, and relatives and uh, compatriots in the rest of the country to get on board. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Senator Angus King is with us right now. I don't think he requires any introduction at all. It's been my pleasure to have worked with him uh, during his time as uh, the governor of the state of Maine and uh, subsequently uh, to have him here today is uh, uh, really closing a circle for many of us who uh, began this journey with Reggie uh, with Ned Sullivan and uh, DEP and many conversations many years ago it is wonderful to have him with us today I'm not going to waste any more of his time Senator King please join us thank you Yes. Uh, well, first I want to talk about Maine's wonderful natural resources. Arista County, Mount Katahdin, Bar Harbor, the city of Portland, and Charlie Colgan. <laughs> I was standing in the back listening to Charlie and leaned over to Alan Karen and said, you know, this guy is a natural resource for Maine and has been, and I really want to thank you, Charlie. To, to have somebody like him who has been uh, an honest spokesman on these issues for so many years uh, and has brought so many insights to us and, and gives us the data that allows us to uh, make good policy decisions, it's a real, uh, has been, you really contributed a, a, a great service. I do remember when I was first running for governor in 1994, uh, Charlie and I had, were friends, and of course one of Charlie's best friends is Dick Berenger, who was also running that year. And uh, Charlie actually had on his desk uh, a Swiss flag to, to demonstrate his neutrality. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, this, is, uh, this is a big deal. You know, I, I'm convinced that one of the problems that we have around here, not in Maine, but just generally, is we don't celebrate enough. You know, we're very good at identifying the problems, and there are a hell of a lot of problems. And, you know, I work in the U.S. Senate. I mean, that's a problem right there. Uh, but these rules that were announced this week are a huge step forward for the country. Most significant uh, acknowledgement and, and doing something about uh, the issue of, of climate change and, uh, and fossil fuel use and uh, the environment and the, uh, the air uh, in, in as long as I can remember, really. Uh, and it was really fun. I was, I, I was doing a little research last night and uh, found a great quote. It said, these rules will bring an end to the automobile industry. Did you already tell them that? These, this is a, almost an exact quote. Automobile production will end in the United States because of this rule. That was Lee Iacocca in 1971 when the Clean Air Act was passed. And there, you can go back and read all of these quotes from everybody who said, and I remember, I said, you know, one of my disadvantages is I'm old enough to remember those days and remember the total gloom and doom of, uh, you know, it, it's going to cost, I mean, it's almost exactly what's being said today. It's going to cost thousands of jobs. It's going to close down. Our, it's gonna, we're not going to be able to compete. It's, you know, it's impossible. Well, I'll tell you one, this is a great story about impossibility. As some of you may know, uh, uh, Chris didn't give me a long introduction. Sometimes people go through my whole resume and, and I get up to the podium and I, the only thing I can think is this guy can't hold a job. 
because I've had, the, my eight years as governor is the longest I've ever hold, held one job in my life. Uh, but one of my jobs was as being the lobbyist for the environmental community in the 70s. Uh, I had the most interesting group of lobbying clients. I represented uh, the, the environmental community, an organization called CRAC, the Coastal Resources Action Committee. Those, some of you remember that, Hadi Hildreth and, and uh, uh, Harry Richardson and others. I also represented that year the students of the University of Maine, um, the cable television industry, and the cosmetologists. So <laughs> I always felt I really had a kind of broad uh, uh, base. But anyway, here's the story. One of the things that was accomplished during that period was the bottle bill. Okay, we passed the bottle bill. Now, many, of, most of you in this audience will not remember this, but when when uh, self-opening cans were first uh, on the market, you had this circle that you pulled and the thing came out and it was like a razor blade. In fact, it's been immortalized in Jimmy, by Jimmy Buffett in Margaritaville where he talks about uh, blew out my flip-flop, stepped on a pop-top. Those young people, I'm gonna, now gonna tell you what that line means. <laughs> but you'd pull this thing out, it was sharp as hell and, you know, it would get dropped, and it was, it was bad for the environment. It was downright dangerous. And, I, and part of the bottle bill banned those things and said, you can't, you've got, they've got to, it's got to stay attached to the can. And I remember vividly being on the third floor of the State House and having a lobbyist for the bottle industry who shall remain nameless, Severin Beliveau. <laughs> uh, Severin came up to me and he was very serious. You know how Severin can be. He was very serious and, and said, said, you know, Angus, we've, we've, we've really worked on this and our engineers have worked on it. We've had MIT look at it. It's impossible <laughs> to make a pop top that doesn't remove. It's impossible. Well, here we are. I mean, the point is, and that's what's, the, to me, that's what's the best thing about what the EPA did is they allowed the states and industry to have the creativity and the ingenuity to figure out how to get where we want to get. To me, that's the proper role for regulation, not for the EPA to say, you've got to put a, a, a scrubber number XYZ 42, you know, 46 feet in the, in the pipe. No, here's what we can tolerate out of the pipe. You figure out how to do it. And that allows the market to work, it allows uh, ingenuity and creativity to work and you end up with solutions that you didn't you didn't really think of like uh, dealing with uh, uh, cow farts in uh, in Wisconsin could I did I just say that uh, but I, I really I, I, I'm, this is a serious point this is the way we should be regulating in my view uh, rather than prescription I mean the, the opposite example is Congress writing the formula for gasoline you know, this, this gasoline shall have this percentage of this. That's not the way to do it. Uh, technology and science are going to outpace it very quickly about the same time that you get the regulations written. And uh, so th this is a huge breakthrough. And, and I uh, totally agree. I was so glad to hear Charlie say it because I remember in, in you know, the late 90s, uh, what I said was, the current environmental rules as they're being enforced are the worst of all worlds for man. Because we're getting the bad air from the Midwest and they're paying for the cheap power that makes us less competitive. That, that's, that's, uh, you know, that, that's a bad combination for us. Here, here's a great story about that. Uh, Ned Sullivan has been mentioned, my uh, wonderful uh, first uh, commissioner of environmental protection, March, uh, Martha Kirkpatrick was the second. By the way, a sad day, Martha has left her post as the pastor up in Belfast and is going to Delaware of all places. I'm so sorry to hear about that. But, uh, uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> I'm sitting in the office one day and I get this call. Ned left Maine and went to work for Scenic Hudson in New York. And I get this call from Maine. This is like 19, I don't know, 99 or 2000. And, and Ned's breathless. Ned's always breathless. And Ned says, you won't believe what happened last night. There was apparently a hearing in somewhere in upstate New York on the construction of a new cement plant. And the, ex the air expert for the people that wanted to build the cement plant testified in the hearing 
they, somebody asked him about, you know, the stuff going up the stack and the smoke and particulates and, and, and pollution, and he said, he said to, this is public, he said to the, to the board, the uh, uh, New York Board of Environmental Protection, he said, we don't have to really worry about what's coming out of this stack because it's not going to get to the ground until it gets to Maine. <laughs> So Ned called me that morning. That's a true story. And I immediately called Pataki and said, this isn't going to work. You know? I don't think that plant ever got built. But, that, but that's, that's what I'm talking about. And yet we're, uh, the other thing that makes it hard in Maine, and, and Charlie is right about uh, 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 energy rates, is many of the other areas of the country are federally subsidized. The TVA in, in the southeast, of course, which is still a federal entity, an independent independent but federal entity, is 30,000 megawatts. The TVA is as big as the whole New England power grid. And out west, of course, is the Bonneville Power Authority and the great projects of the Roosevelt era, uh, uh, Hoover Dam. Did you know that Roosevelt wouldn't let him name it Hoover Dam? I mean, political pettiness did not start last year. Uh, and they, they, you know, it was Boulder Dam for a while, and then, you know, it was Hoover's idea and concept, and finally it became Hoover Dam. But those were huge federal projects which amounted to subsidies of the energy costs of the peoples of those regions. We never had that. And that's why I was always sort of amused when people said, we, isn't it awful we're getting federal subsidies for wind power? I said, wait a minute, we're just getting what the other guys got 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, it, it just makes sense. But um, Charlie really said everything that needs saying. This uh, global climate change is real. It's going to have significant economic effects. And uh, I think in the long run, dealing with it is going to be, I, I don't think, I know, dealing with it is going to be cheaper than not dealing with it. Just in terms of raw economics, just in terms of costs, and, and uh, ju just in terms of things, you know, the infrastructure kinds of things. Uh, and the effects particularly on coastal states. As you know, probably the greatest champion on climate change in the Senate is, is uh, Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. But I, I saw him the other day and I said, I finally figured out why you're so passionate about this. He said, how come? I said, because you don't want your state to go away. You know, Rhode Island is one of the most vulnerable uh, places. Uh, but I'm very uh, uh, positive about the way they've gone about this regulation and what, and, and Maine is going to be in good shape. Uh, and by the way, don't let anybody tell you how, you know, how draconian this was. The EPA actually made a decision that was hugely beneficial uh, to, to uh, emitters by using 2005 as the base year instead of 2012. We're already halfway, isn't it halfway, 15 percent? We're already close to halfway to the 30 percent goal. Already, it's, it's in the bank by what's been done uh, since 2005. So uh, that was a big break, I think, for, uh, for industry. So uh, it, and it's going to be a hell of a fight. I can tell you, in the, in the Senate, it's going to be, uh, I don't know whether it's, what's going to happen between now and November, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the the uh, traditional uh, people who are opposed to regulation, who are opposed to President Obama, who are opposed to, you know, pretty much anything involving climate, you add to them coal state Democrats, and it's going to be close. It's, uh, and I can't predict the outcome. I think uh, we'll be okay, but there's going to be a major battle between now and November to try to repeal these rules or delay them or otherwise remove the authority from the EPA to make these rules. It's going to be, I think, one of the major political, uh, it's going to exceed Keystone, I think, over the next three or four months as, as an environmental issue. So uh, you don't have to worry about me. I don't, I don't know where Susan is on this, uh, but you also need to talk to people uh, in other states. Now, I will say one of my best friends in the Senate is Joe Manchin. Anybody know where Joe's from? West Virginia. Now, I think the administration did make a mistake, which they could have, which could have helped to ameliorate the 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 at least political and and public impacts of this. By at the same time, the rules were announced, announced a significant investment in uh, coal technology. 
which would have helped with people like Joe. Uh, Joe's position is, you know, I'm from a coal state, coal is a huge part of the energy source of this country, let's figure out how to do it better. You, we're not going to make coal go away. I mean, I'm, you know, I hate to be the deliverer of that, but it's just too much a part of our energy uh, uh, base in the, in the United States, not so much in New England. But so, uh, in addition to uh, the rules that were just announced, I think there should be a billion dollars or some amount of money invested in a kind of Manhattan project to try to clean up uh, the, the emissions from coal. And I realize that many people say, no, we don't want to do coal at all. Uh, I think given the energy mix in the country today, that's a goal perhaps in, a, in some period of time. But in the meantime, let's, let's uh, try to uh, lighten, uh, lighten the impact. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the, the, the situation. I, uh, I am optimistic about the rules. Let me also give you a little something for your, for your argument kit. Uh, you're going to hear, this is Obama doing things by himself. By the way, here's the line. I, I was tr presiding the other day. Are you impressed? <laughs> Don't be. It's a chore for freshmen. Uh, but it's fun. And, it, and it's also pretty cool to be sitting there and have John McCain say, Mr. President. They call, they call you Mr. President. Uh, but anyway, I was presiding, and it was... Uh, I think it was Tuesday, and it was a day many of the Republicans came to the floor to denounce the rules. Mitch McConnell, uh, I can't remember a few others. The Obama energy tax, that's the phrase. I must have heard it 20 times in an hour. So clearly somebody's done some polling or something. That's the phrase that you're going to hear, the Obama energy tax. Uh, but. Uh, uh, one thing you should know, and this is just a little fact because I get all of this mail in the office, about Obama and executive orders. You've heard this, right? The imperial presidency, Obama's bypassing Congress, doing everything by executive orders. Here's a really interesting fact. If you calculate executive orders issued per day, which is a reasonable way to compare apples to apples for presidents that had four-year terms and eight-year terms, Obama has issued fewer executive orders per day than any president since Grover Cleveland. Isn't that surprising? Doesn't that surprise you? That, that you know, there's, you can go on, if you Google executive orders, you can find these charts. And the, you know, it's sort of a mountain that starts in the late 1880s with Grover Cleveland, and it goes up and up and up, and, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, and Ronald Reagan, Nixon, and then, it, and then Obama's way down here. So that's, I just, that's just sort of a, a, a sub, mention. These are not his regulations. This is the regulations of the Environmental Protection Agency based on the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court told them that they could do this and then they did a study about the impacts and found that there were health impacts and that put them in a situation where they're legally obligated to do it. The court said they have the opportunity and uh, or the, the legal authority and then the study which said there are in fact health and, and human effects then that means they have to do it. And there's a fascinating article, I think it's in Politico, you can Google it, and you really ought to read it. Again, you ought to have this in your kit uh, by a guy named Leon Billings. It came out two days ago. And Leon Billings was Muskie's principal aide at the time of the writing of the Clean Air Act. And he talks about the provision 111D in the law, which is the legal authority for what the EPA just did, and how at the time, they knew they didn't know everything about pollutants, but they left this opportunity for the EPA to regulate new pollutants that became apparent later. And here it is, later. And by the way, here's an amazing thing about the Clean Air Act. Astonishing. The Clean Air Act, one of the most important pieces of legislation in the 20th century, very controversial. Remember I said Lee Iacocca, everybody's just going to put the whole world out of business. The Clean Air Act passed the United States Senate unanimously. Isn't that breathtaking? It tells you something about Muskie's leadership, but it also tells you something about then and now. Muskie spent years with, on hearings, hundreds of hours of hearings, hundreds of hours of markup, working with his colleagues, he got every single vote. And in the middle of the debate, 
Howard Baker, the Republican leader, gave his proxy to Muskie on some important votes. Can you imagine Mitch McConnell giving his proxy to Harry Reid or Barbara Boxer? <laughs> but that, I mean, I, I think it does. It says two things. One is what an amazing guy Muskie was. But secondly, how, uh, how, how far we've fallen in terms of our ability to get things done. And I can't, I can't not mention the, this, this firestorm, this, this great uh, issue of the last few days about the young man coming home from Afghanistan. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot to discuss about that. But I got to say, it, it sort of, uh, I found it ironic that here's these guys who can't legislate, but they're very good at second guessing the president. Uh, you know, we, we're not doing our job, but I, I, I said on television yesterday, we've got 535 secretaries of state running around here. Uh, I, I, that, that, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so, uh, the rules are the right thing. They're going I think they're going to be beneficial to Maine. Maine has a, I think 13% is our, is our target. Uh, Vermont's is zero. Uh, but states that are, that are less, you know, that are going to have to make some real changes, that's going to be tough. And it's going to be tough on them politically in, uh, in uh, this election year. Uh, but uh, hopefully we're going to be able to get through this and, come out on the other side with a set of, of creative solutions from across the country that are going to uh, be good for the economy and, uh, and certainly good for the environment. So thanks for having me, and I'm supposed to introduce the panel. Yes. But, but you can applaud if you want. <laughs>